people that are here as well as Andrew's guests, uh, Dr. Tony O'Driscoll, Dr. David Metcalf, and, and Dr. Carl Kopp are all here uh, to, to have a wonderful conversation today. And uh, they have all been friends of Training Magazine Network uh, throughout our history. So it's a great time for Anders to have gotten the band back together. And we have an especially wonderful session for you today. I have to tell you, I, I, I had to change the name of uh, the uh, session. I know some of you are looking at me going, hey, wait a second, cans of worms. That wasn't what I signed up for. Well, whenever we get together for the prep session, and you start to hear these gentlemen rip off of each other with all the depth of the knowledge that they have and the things that are coming up and the things that could be possible every time they say something. I thought they open a can of worms. Uh, and so we had to change the title. And I noticed that we doubled the registration when we did that. So welcome to everybody, whether you signed up for the original version or this one. A uh, couple of other things. Again, I'm Gary Van Antwerp. I just want to welcome you to the community. We have some other sessions coming up that are just really incredible sessions in their own right. Taylor Kroonquist, I asked to come back and, and do this charting tricks uh, webinar uh, that he'll be he'll be uh, doing on the 25th, uh, that's tomorrow. And then Josh Cavalier is going to be back with, he's going to be talking about generative AI tactics for L&D specifically. And he'll talk, Josh always talks about prompt and then he'll uh, talk about automation as well. Tim Hagen will be back in May uh, too to talk about coaching. Um, I do want to let everybody know that the Choice Awards are open now and something you should know about the Choice Awards is that uh, if you look at this, uh, you will see that down here on the bottom, it says that when you vote, you will be entered for a chance to win a U.S. Bank $100 gift card. So uh, I'll put this back up at the end of our session, or you can just go to the navigation bar in Training Mag Network, and you'll be able to vote and be entered for that. We really want to get your input. And last, we want to thank Open Sesame for sponsoring today's uh, session. Uh, Open Sesame is a MOOC, in case you don't know what uh, uh, what they are or what they do. And how many of you, just take this little poll for me right now on the screen, how many of you know what a MOOC is? Which of these is what a MOOC is? Okay, I'll give you a minute. Okay, some people say that, some people say that, and that, and that, okay. So Open Sesame has 30,000 courses that you can use in your training department without having to reinvent all of them. But the majority of you have this right. Uh, is uh, MOOC is a massive open online course. So uh, congratulations on getting those right. There, there are your results right there, okay? We want to thank Open Sesame for making this session possible uh, and being a great partner throughout. So again, let's go ahead and get started with AI cans of worms for Four visionaries on the state and the future of AI and spatial learning. And we're going to lead off with our friend, Dr. Anders Grunstedt. He is the president of the Grunstedt Group. So, Anders, uh, all yours, sir. Well, thank you so much, Gary. And I'm just thrilled to have the three smartest people I know of uh, and very good friends in the, in the business uh, to uh, 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 try to reflect on where we are and where we're going as a learning industry. Uh, we had the same panel, the same uh, panelist, uh, a little over a year ago. And man, what a year this has been. Uh, we now have not one, but two spatial computers or uh, mixed reality headsets uh, on the market. Uh, and a generative AI is in its uh, second year and it's reshaping a lot of what we're doing. So uh, I, before we go on, uh, let's take a couple of poll questions just to see how much experience people here uh, have. Uh, so let's uh, start with, uh, have you, and I, I'm sorry about the uh, um, uh, typo here, uh, but uh, how many of you have experience with uh, the new generation of mixed reality slash spatial computing, uh, depending on which brand name you prefer? Uh, so, uh, have you tried? So, have you tried it yourself? Uh, Quest Three or Apple Vision Pro with a pass-through video? And, um, oh, only 
ten percent. I'll, I'll encourage you as far as the Apple Vision Pro is obviously very cost prohibitive, but you can uh, go into an Apple store, set up a demo online, and go in and try it out. It's definitely worth it. Uh, the Quest Three is just five hundred bucks. Anyone in the learning industry should should have one to uh, to experience uh, what uh, how, how to integrate uh, the, the virtual uh, and the real life around you. Uh, so just one more question then uh, on generative AI. It would be interesting to hear uh, how frequently do you guys use uh, whether it's uh, GPT-4, ChatGPT, or uh, or any of the other um, uh, uh, options there. Uh, do you use it several times a day, several times a week, uh, more rarely? Interesting. I. I pretty much use it as a starting point rather than going to Google. I just go to GPT-4 for anything. And Carl will talk a little bit about how he uses it for, for speech. It's just revolutionized the way I do my, my personal work. But uh, yeah, at least uh, a uh, slight majority are, are using it on a, on a regular basis. Interesting. All right. So before I turn it over, so uh, the panelists here have uh, some prepared uh, remarks. Uh, I just want to share a, a work case that we've been working on for the last year that's been really cool and I think is pointing at where technology is going. Uh, and it's for the U.S. Navy. We've been working uh, on the, if you change slide there, Gary, uh, moving their training for their submariners, as they call them, the submarine crew, from the classroom uh, out to the uh, the actual submarines. The next, there you go. So uh, so they have the current, the traditional model, model of bringing their sailors into a classroom for several weeks of training, and then they send them out on submarines for six months tours. Can you imagine that? They're circling the Atlantic and, and the Pacific and don't see the sunlight or, and barely have any internet connection for, for six months. And uh, what they're learning in the classroom, it can take three, four months before they actually get to practice it when they're out on the, the submarine. So uh, we uh, um, have worked with them on the idea of actually putting a MetaQuest 3 or other similar headset on the submarine to have them refresh the knowledge on how to turn on a diesel generator is the project we started with, uh, right on the submarine, put on the headset and you feel like you're in a machinery room. And uh, uh, it's not yet on the submarines, it's an R&D project, but uh, it's getting rave reviews from the, the sailors. Uh, we're of course running into all kinds of issues with both cybersecurity and all, also comfort and space. Uh, you do need uh, about 10 by 10 foot area to, to do uh, uh, room scale BR uh, effectively. So we also developed a handheld version with a new generation. We're using the uh, Asus Rogue Ally uh, of handheld gaming computers where in the, our pitches you can lay in your uh, your, your bed uh, in, in your bank to uh, to do the training and refresh yourself on knowledge and uh, I think this goes to just how we're blurring the lines between learning and work and also between uh, learning and play here uh, so instead of going into the classroom uh, it's it's all done on these entertainment devices right in the flow of work. And uh, that's one of the trends we'll be, be talking about here. So I'll, I want to start off with uh, Carl, uh, who's going to introduce us to his AI version, uh, which makes us all a little spooked out. We're not quite sure here whether uh, we're talking to the real Carl or not, but uh, take it away, Carl. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I'm not sure. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, so excited to be here. Uh, one of my favorite sayings is always be the dumbest guy in the room. So here I am. Uh, and I want to talk <laughs> a little bit about. Um, uh, AI and kind of show you a demonstration of how I've used it. So uh, Gary's going to launch this video and everybody will be able to take a look at the AI Dr. Cop. Hello, this is Carl Cop, Professor Cop. Well, actually, this is my digital clone, Digital Professor Cop. And not just a digital clone of my face and body, but a digital clone of my voice. I did not speak these words or stand in front of a camera to make this video. It's all a Professor Cop deep fake. What I did was type in my words, choose the look for my avatar, which was three quarter shoulder length or bubble. Then I was good to go. Now I can type in whatever I'd like and have digital Professor Cop talk with you. I can even be a floating head in the corner explaining key slides. This allows me to quickly go back and make some changes if my script varies or needs to be modified in the future. 
I can even speak different languages. 你好，我是卡尔·科普，科普教授。这是我的数字，克隆体也是我声音的数字，克隆体 A I 被教导如何像我一样说话，你觉得怎么样 ？Olá, este é Carl Cop, professor Cop. Este é um clone digital meu e um clone digital da minha voz. A I foi ensinado a falar como eu. O que você acha? So, what do you think? Do you like my digital twin? Do you think it looks like me? Does it sound like me? Could you be fooled? Ah, so that's virtual、um, and digital clone of、uh, Dr. Carl Cop. So、um, I love the reactions.、Uh, everything from I love it all the way. My favorite reaction ever was somebody said,、um, "I'm nauseating. I'm nauseated. I'm leaving."、Uh, so、uh, lots of different kind of comments, but. The interesting thing is, I used a piece of software called Colossian, but there's a there's Synthesia, there's one called Heyday, there's a bunch being、um, created. And the nice thing about it is,、um, it took me a while to stand in the studio, and they had to record me, and I had to say some say,、uh, phrases. So that took about an hour, but my voice took about five minutes. I recorded my voice, I sent it off to them, and five minutes later, I had. My AI voice, and I match my voice with my AI clone. And the interesting thing is that the、um, voice and clone don't have to go together. So a lot of time I'll be speaking in a different voice or put my voice on a different clone, which is all really kind of interesting. And I think, as as many people said, scary as well.、Uh, I don't、uh, in the AI. I don't. I'm not able to move my hands as much. I'm not allowed to gesture as much. Facial expression isn't quite there,、um, so there's a few things that are missing. But as they say,、uh, this is as bad as AI is going to get. So it's only going to get、uh, better, and it's only going to change and morph. And so with this,、uh, we definitely opened up uh, uh,、um, a can of worms, right? And so I don't have all the answers to this can of worms.、Uh, I feel sometimes that like. We're in a tsunami, and we're just holding on, or you know, with the tech and things like that. But、uh, let's talk a little bit about what、um, what we have done here.、Um, so, artificial intelligence basically is a simulation of human intelligence by machines, and it's used for a lot of different things in the environment. But it's important to know that AI changes just about daily. In fact, in 2023, I asked AI. For a technology quote from Abraham Lincoln, I wanted to know what Abraham Lincoln had to say about technology. And lo and behold, Abraham Lincoln says it's a, me- a means by which uh, the future uh, we make the future a reality, bridging time with innovation. Now, of course, AI didn't say、uh, Ben Franklin didn't say that. And now in 2024, it's gotten smarter and said, you know what, Carl, I can't do that.、Uh, Abraham Lincoln was in the 19th century. Now you could argue there's different types of technology, but not the technology that that we were thinking about. So there's a lot of promise. I just want to say a couple things. One, AI is not a strategy, right? It's a business first, technology second. So use it to enable, create the vision of what you want the future, then AI. Also,、um, it's already in your organizations. So if you are using Teams, if you're using Zoom, Zoom recently announced that they won't use any customer data, but they have this little button down here called AI Companion. And what AI Companion will do will catch you up in a meeting. So it will find your name and give you all the、uh, action items that you're supposed to do. It will、uh, find out when your name was mentioned, and it will even summarize the entire discussion for you. So it's pretty interesting how the regular tools that we have already have AI, and in fact, Adobe Firefly AI. One of the things I think that we make a mistake is is that we talk about AI as this monolithic item, right? But AI voice, AI video clone. AI removing backgrounds are all kinds of of different from this. So、um, it's important to think about how AI works. In fact, in 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 your organization, you probably have some AI model behind your firewall, or someone in your company is working on that. So you want to find out if they are, because you really don't want to use the publicly available things with any of your own data,、um, even the People who build the models are like, I don't put personal data in there. I don't put corporate data in there. So we need to to watch out for that.、Um, so you want to find out any kind of guidance from your IT folks. You want to find out、um, what the models can be used for. If you're use、um, 
uh, Microsoft, you've got Copilot, so we're using that, although there's some really interesting issues with Copilot and security. So if you don't have security set up for, for uh, Microsoft SharePoint, which I bet you don't, uh, there could be some problems. And so all kinds of stuff about uh, Copilot. Um, and speaking of deep fakes, so we saw the deep fake Dr. Cop, and it's kind of fun, and I kind of authorize that. But there was recently uh, over in Asia a case where a gentleman um, actually wired $25 million, 200 million Hong Kong dollars, to a fraudster. Uh, he got an email. He thought it was fake about moving this money, so he didn't pay attention. But then he got another email that said, we need to have a meeting. And it was a meeting with the executives of the company. Turns out all those executives were fake. He got on the video call with them and they told him, we need you to wire this money. Here's why. Don't tell anybody, et cetera. And boom, he he did it. So uh, there's as much danger as there is opportunity with AI that I wanted to talk about. And there's a lot with, con somebody asked about, uh, AI content creation. So um, Andre says he uses it for ideas. I use it for brainstorming. You can actually, if you use chat GPT, then others, you can actually customize it to give responses like yourself. So I say, you know, hey, give me a paragraph how Dr. Cop would talk about gamification. Sometimes it does a great job. Sometimes I'm like, what? He would never say that. And you have to kind of modify or change it. But it allows me to jump off from that uh, jumping point. Also lots of image generators. So if you uh, um, want to use Bing to create, you can create images here. I wanted images for a technician in a lab, very quickly do that, which is very nice. They can generate videos as we saw. Here's an animation tool called Beyond. They have a element called Beyond Go. You type in a prompt, you pick your scene and it creates an animated cartoon of what you put in for about two minutes. And, and literally, it takes less than uh, a minute to develop that. Uh, other uh, items, this is one called Seven Taps. And Seven Taps, you can pull in your own content and it will create a little micro learning course. Uh, it's a start. I, I think it's all start. It's things that we need to, to do to uh, make that happen. And AI can even create its own prompts. So uh, creating its own prompts it's kind of interesting as well. And create course content. Here you can put a video or a chapter in and it creates all that content. So it's really kind of interesting. Um, I uh, Okay, so that's all that I had to say. I could talk a lot more about it, but uh, as I said, uh, we wanna hear from these, these other folks. So I'm, I'm looking at, yeah, thank you, Carl. I'm looking at chat. I think the consensus is it's pretty, pretty close. It's a little cold and not quite as animated uh, as you are in uh, uh, real life, but we seem like we've crossed the uncanny valley as it is. Uh, so please keep your uh, comments and questions uh, flowing here in chat. We'll be monitoring it uh, throughout the hour and want to make this uh, a dialogue. And of course, I, I forgot to, I just took for granted that everyone knows the panelist. Carl, of course, is uh, the uh, leading uh, thought leader in uh, learning and gamification and a very pro pro prolific uh, author on the topic. I'll uh, encourage you to read his work. Uh, so next up is David Metcalf, uh, who works uh, in the middle of, uh, literally, uh, he has his office right in the middle of all the uh, DOD uh, military simulation work, uh, and is very close to that, uh, and has been an authority recently on uh, blockchain as well, and AI, and always has the coolest uh, example. So uh, David, uh, uh, what, what's your take on what's going on and well, what are you working on? Well, we're pretty blown away every day by uh, the work, uh, just like what Carl showed too, of uh, just how easy some of the um, application development and uh, learning development ha is becoming. And that's been uh, you know, really, uh, really good. So uh, um, one of the things that uh, we, we call it my presentation there too. Uh, one of the things that we've gotten a chance to do, just like you said, is to really focus on both the front end and the back end of spatial computing and look at the next generation of development of digital twins. So using things like AI, blockchain, and uh, 
you know, uh, cybersecurity, we say, but a lot of that is the next generation of quantum. On the back end, even of our training systems, these records are really, really valuable. And those are some of the types of things that, um, that we're building upon. Um, one of the uh, things we've gotten to play with recently is looking at AI as a service and seeing if in each area of media, they sometimes call it multimodal development, if we've had an opportunity to go in and uh, speed up the process and improve the quality of anything from our instructional design elements and our media um, to our um, work that we've been doing in, uh, you know, uh, of course, image generation. Those are the types of things that we're seeing a lot of opportunities. So um, as we get the slides up too, we'll um, get a chance to see some of those in action. But we've had an opportunity to go and see. Sometimes uh, we just had one for Python coding that uh, would have taken about three or four days that was done in 20 minutes, as an example. Um, even if we put our absolute best programmer on that task, it still would have been a day. So a 24x uh, improvement in speed. And the end results of this, uh, it was a Magic Leap um, um, actual application. The end results of that was uh, a decrease from a uh, uh, 2800 uh, milliseconds uh, down to 1.1 millisecond. So uh, with the code that was generated using uh, GPT-4. So those are some of the types of things we're seeing in terms of huge productivity gains for many of the people that I know who are in this network are either, either uh, developers or they have developers that work for them. This is going to be a game changer. It already, it already is really with the tools we have now. And like I heard earlier, those tools are just getting better um, every day too. We're so finding David tools. Yes, huh? Excuse me, David. I'm sorry. I'm having a little trouble pulling up your uh, your presentation, your deck, and I'm wondering if we could share it from your desktop because I know you'd like to show it. I'd love to show it, but uh, remember, I don't have a desktop, so I'm. Uh, <laughs> oh, uh, boy, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll keep uh, working on it as you. Okay. Uh, yeah. If it on. comes All up, right. it comes up. I'll just uh, riff and talk about it a little bit too, and maybe get to show a couple of the digital twin examples uh, too uh, as we as we get going, but. Uh, but yeah, so we've been able to use and set up sandboxes for the Department of Defense, the Department of Energy, a number of big companies to be able to explore some of these tools in the early days. I do have a, a slide that um, hopefully we'll be able to show of some of those uh, tool sets, but um, those are some of the things that uh, you know might be of, of interest to the audience too. Um, and um, let's just uh, try something here and just see if this even works. So. Um, yeah, so ABC, AI, blockchain, cybersecurity, we have a whole series of, uh, of books that are, that are in this area. And some of it stems off of early work we did, even like 10 years ago, of building out digital, uh, in this case, pilots, too. So that's what you're seeing here. Um, you can see on there the ability to um, go in and have this um, kind of next generation pilot that's a hologram and uh, be able to go and see um, and also have artificial intelligence so that there's an intelligence to that particular pilot. Um, I've been able to do the same thing to create a digital twin for the army. And in this case, what you have here is the ability to keep track of on blockchain all of their records um, from recruit to retire. And in this case, it's on range training, snipers and things. And that's a digital twin that's accessible from mobile. So you can see the whole readiness of your, your whole organization. So some of the types of things we've been, uh, been working on. Um, we have uh, digital twins for um, anything from um, the uh, Veterans Administration, the VA. Let me show this one as well, too. To um, here, hang on. Digital twins of the VA and uh, also buildings uh, and uh, training facilities, kind of next generation training facilities for um, the Department of Energy, too. This is a state of the art training uh, facility. We had about uh, 28 days to build their digital twin and start to let them look at the workflow of training and also to look at some very specialized uh, capabilities. If you've seen some of the Hollywood productions like The Mandalorian, they have these digital walls. And what you're seeing here, hopefully, is a digital wall. 
and a real um, device inside of a hospital, a hologram of a, um, in that particular case, of a security guard, and also a uh, real uh, nurse with a real set of goggles on. So that's an example of mixed reality kind of on a sound stage, and the next generation of applying that to uh, complex scenarios, like in a hospital where you're looking at the cybersecurity of the hospital. That's what uh, you're kind of seeing there. We're uh, applying that to visualization of a number of other things, even uh, where we are here in Florida, even on the Space Coast, and looking at how this could be used for space operations and uh, having a digital twin of the whole operation. You can see the different uh, common operating picture environments there too, that um, you have uh, the ability to go in and, uh, and look at. Um, there's one more slide that I kind of wanted to show you, but uh, let me see if I can get it to uh, to show well on the screen. I don't think it's going to, but uh, Gary, if, uh, if, if the uh, PowerPoint has uh, failed us, I may need to come back with a, uh, a list uh, if you do get that up and running to uh, be able to show a few of those examples of the tool sets that we're using too. Um, I'll rattle off a few of them too, just so that people are uh, aware too. Um, this week we have started using uh, Llama 3, which uh, is allowing us to accelerate our instructional design, building learning objectives, putting those into unique uh, formats. We can even say things like, oh, I need this uh, information. I need it to be in 75 characters. I need this to be in 150 words for this particular area. And it goes and it starts to assemble the information, does the information design automatically. So that's been really um, convenient for us to be able to do that. And um, then uh, for things like uh, images, we've been using uh, Dolly 3 from OpenAI. And we've also been using Firefly from Adobe and um, a number of other tools too. There's one that I kind of like if you're on a mobile app called Leonardo. And uh, all these have at least some element of uh, tribe before you buy uh, out there too, that you can take a look at. Um, a few of them like Dolly 3 have started to do things like logos well. They couldn't do text up until maybe nine weeks ago <laughs> that they could do text well, those types of things. So those are some of the different uh, tools we use in, um, in uh, image generation. And then um, we've been uh, using tools for uh, audio uh, development like uh, Eleven Labs and uh, some of the work that there is from Stable Audio and uh, Stable LM. There's also uh, some, some uh, new ones uh, that are coming out too that we've been, uh, had a chance to look at in the, uh, the audio area. But uh, those are maybe a few just examples. And I have this on a chart if we get it to, to come up too, but uh, just want to give you a quick rundown of a few of those that might be useful to you. Um, hey, David. On the, uh, yes. Sorry to interrupt you. Your uh, uh, deck is reloading. Uh, so it may, if, but you know, as you know, it's a very large deck. Uh, so we might be able to pull it up at the end. And also I'm wondering, I'm converting it to PDF. Would it be okay to give it to people, to let people nope, download it? give it out, but uh, ah, you okay, could, that's uh, what I'm yeah, and uh, the PDF will not have any of the, uh, the uh, animations or audio and oh, stuff, but it will course. at least show the... Uh, the, the, the one uh, slide too that, uh, so when we get to that too, um, maybe what I'll do then just to uh, change it up a little bit too is um, uh, maybe you can give me a thumbs up in uh, the presenter text and I'll watch for that. But for now, maybe I could turn it over to uh, back to Andres to, uh, to move on and have Tony show his as well sure. too. Yeah, so as many of you know, Tony and Carl wrote the uh, uh, seminal book on 3D learning, and uh, Tony has a great piece is, is that still, uh, I think, feels very current in the Harvard Business Review about uh, uh, gaming as a leadership for leadership development, World of Warcraft. Uh, and it's a great thinker, uh, marketing uh, and leadership professor at uh, Duke. So, uh, and Tony, you, have, you also have an AI version of yourself, right, that you've been working on? I do. Format, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do. Let's see if I if I can drive these things here. Yeah, okay. So I won't cover as um, Carl kind of covered this, but I'll come at it from a slightly different angle. Um, so so the first the first piece here is is kind of carrying off on, on a little bit more depth into um, what Carl did in terms of just the process. So so uh, this piece is called creating counterfeit humans with AI and. That's a nod to um, Dan Dennett, who we just recently lost, but he wrote a fantastic article in The Atlantic about 
counterfeit humans and the danger of AI. Um, counterfeit money is illegal. You know, counterfeit drugs are illegal. Uh, and his argument is counterfeit humans should be illegal. And, and, and um, Carl kind of alluded to this because he said, hey, this was a sanctioned version of myself. So, so you know, Carl Cop AI. Um, is is his digital twin, as David would have talked about. I think I think something we have to contemplate and think about is I remember my freshman year in school, uh, I had a professor in English, and he uh, <laughs> he wouldn't give you the grade; he'd give you a tape, and he, you'd have to listen to his responses. And I'm talking about I'm so old; it was a cassette tape. For those of you who are on the chat who are younger, you may not even know what I'm talking about. And he he he'd interject the grade somewhere in the middle, so you kind of had to listen to feedback before you figure out what the grade was. But then what happened was kids would take the, the tapes and remix them. They'd remix them and say, and say, oh, well, you didn't do that. Oh, well, screw you. I thought it was really good. And we all had a lot of fun. Like, I could imagine that there will be a lot of remixes of Prof. Tony AI and, and Carl, Dr. Carl.ai coming up. Uh, and that's something we have to manage and, and watch for. So here's my problem. Uh, the student access problem, the one in five access problem. Uh, this is the class engineering management 542. It's strategy class. And uh, this is for spring of 2004. And my office hours are Wednesday, 1.30 till 3. Okay, so uh, that's the office hours. And, 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 uh, and the problem I have here is that the office hour supply is 90 minutes times 14 weeks in the semester. That's 24, 21 hours of time for students to see me. My challenge is that I've got 420 students and over the period of the semester, they want at least 15 minutes or put differently, half of them want to come for a half hour. So that's 105 hours. So I got a five to one ratio problem in terms of supply and demand of my time to meet with the students. Um, and they're always, you know, literally after class, you know, going to get something to come get to eat and come back to class, et cetera, et cetera. And I feel really bad. I'm like, you know, I wish I had more time, but time is unfortunately, even Bill Gates said, you give up a half his money for more time. So what's the answer? The answer is the anytime solution. So my my fall semester, which is coming up in, in August, is gonna my syllabus will look like this. Um, competitive strategy, same class, fall 2024, office hours 24 seven, click here. Uh, so so I'm, I'm trying to basically uh, provide the students with, with, with an experience where they can, they can have access to me. Uh, but then we went through a little bit of design thinking and I have a, a, a lot of, uh, three really, really bright students I've been working with over the last six months to try to pull this together. It's not it's not simple to do what I, what I did and I'm still in the process, but we're very close now. Um, but I want I want to show you just a little bit. So how do you create a doppelganger? Uh, the first thing you have to do is Jsonify yourself, <laughs> which means I took um, uh, class PowerPoints from I, I've been teaching marketing for five years, strategy for four years, transformation for I think two years. So all of the audio, so taking all of the Panopto lectures, taking the audio, putting it into JSON files, uh, and then also the actual PowerPoints, the content that I created for the classes and dumping that in. And then over the last five years, I got about 100 articles that came out, uh, content from my prior two books. Um, keynotes, webinars, podcasts, all of that. Big, big process to take all this content, like literally the last five years of my life. And the irony is, um, after it was all done, after they were JSONified and tagged and tokenized and all of that mess that you have to do to kind of get the content ready to, 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 to put into the system, uh, what you're looking at here is a carbon-based life form. I'm, I'm 15 megs of data. That's it. 15 megs, you know, all the, all, all of my lectures pretty much compressed into text to audio and all tagged, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, 50, you know, my whole life has been reduced to 15 megs, uh, which that made me worry. So that's the data part. Um, then the contextualization part is, okay, what do the students want? So when I meet with the students, a lot of time the virtual office hours are what's going to be on the test and what should I study and, you know, da, 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 da. or I didn't get this right. What's the answer? I see Carl nodding, right? We have all those meetings and, and we have the same meeting 25 times. Uh, particularly around around exams. Uh, the second thing is students who might actually be interested. I teach a, a master's level students, so then they're kind of they're interested in going beyond you know what what we teach. So if I teach strategy and you know at Duke graduate level, obviously I'm teaching uh, the current stuff, but I also have my own theories and models. So so then I, I have hey if you want to explore my stuff and and kind of go extend beyond and where where I'm thinking, uh, that's the next level of conversation that the students want to have. And then the third is, hey, I, I just want to have a cup of, everyone's like, can we have a coffee chat? Can we have a coffee chat? Can we have a coffee chat? So so the third kind of modality is cup of contemplation chat. We're going to have a cup of, and we're going to contemplate and have a chat. Now, those are three different contexts. Uh, and, and at first, what I thought was I would I would dump all this 
my whole 15 megs, which is really nothing. Um, and, and I would use that on top of, we're using it on top of GT, GPT-4, but we're also investigating using Claude right now because the different AIs have different uh, personalities, if you want to call that. And Claude might be a little bit better more for the third uh, use case here. Anyway, um, so at first I thought I'm going to use it all and it's good and, and that's not right. So, so what we've ended up having to do is rip out the strategy class content, the marketing class content, and the transformation class content as their own layers on top of GPT so that the students can just inter interrogate it in a much more kind of um, uh, direct fashion. And they also prefer to use audio. It's almost like, you know, an advanced Quizlet. They want to prepare themselves for the test or they want to ask what they got wrong. So, so that was a big learning. At first, we put all of my content into one domain sitting on top of a GPT. Uh, after, afterwards, we've actually broken it out into three pieces of content. Um, the second thing, that the, the next thing is the thing I didn't even know, uh, and, and I think promptification is just because I like things to rhyme. Um, a lot of people say prompt engineering. Uh, having done this now for the last six months, I don't think it's prompt engineering. I think it's prompt crafting. And I, al I almost have come to believe it's almost like being a parent. So once all this content gets put in and we divide the content into these different areas and we knew what problem we were trying to solve for the students, there's kind of four things, and this is borrowed heavily from Ethan Mollick's work. Uh, there's persona crafting. So when, when you're trying to train these AIs, when you're trying to kind of prompt them to, to, to spit out the right thing, you, you, you want to you wanna kind of uh, give them an identity. So you are my tutor. You are my study buddy. Or you are, you know, Prof AI's doppelganger and you, you know, you need to talk like him and so on and so forth. So the second is you want to put con context and constraints. Uh, you want you want for for the for the study buddy thing. It's like just the facts, Jack. Spit out the model and then say why it's important. Whereas in the in the in the theory and model exploration, it's kind of like explain the model, but also say why it's different from existing research and how it advances the research. And then for the cup of contemplation, it's far more be more conversational. Throw in some jokes. Bring that stupid Irish humor that O'Driscoll has, and everybody rolls their eyes. So you have to kind of um, you have to train this thing. Another big thing is chain of thought. So you you want to think out loud uh, as you're as you're as you're trying to train the AI how you would break a problem down, and it starts to learn it. So it, I kind of think of it like benevolent parenting. You know, it, it's like this super super smart kind of uh, ignorant puppy dog that will pee on your foot, and you want to kind of train the dog to no longer pee on your foot. It's a bit like that. Um, it takes a lot longer than you think. I've been messing around with the promptification for probably the last three months now in those three different buckets. And then in terms of the um, UXification, uh, how, how should we interact? The, the the study buddy virtual office hours is text interface. The theoretical model is both text and audio because students also like to listen. Um, and third then for the actual cup of contemplation, we're, we, it's audio, but also avatar. So I don't know. Oh, I don't. It doesn't. It looks like it didn't come up. Um, anyway, so so I had the Uncanny Valley. At first, we were trying to play with cartoons. So that's a, a Prof Tony AI cartoon. Uh, Gary, do you have the video of the creepy one? This is the Uncanny Valley. Uh, it's very similar to Carl's, but if it doesn't come up, that's fine. But essentially, we've been we, we've been trying to kind of get the right mix between the cartoony version, which is um, which is too you can't take it seriously and then there's the picture version which is very like carl's which is creepy it, it, it doesn't get past the uncanny valley it's just short of the uncanny valley so it's like that's a creepy professor uh, and then uh, uh the just right one which i did not build one of my students built uh, i like that i showed it to my wife and she's like who the hell is that 40 p.m uh, and she said, who the hell is that? I'm like, well, that's who I want to be. Uh, so we're going to play with that. Basically, we're going to play with something that's almost real, but not 100% real, because 100% real is too creepy. That one's too cartoony. So we're trying to find the Cinder Cinderella moment for you know what's just right. Um, so the, the lessons learned there. Oh, there it is. Do you want to just, it's very similar to Carl's. Yeah, go ahead. The environment. Just... In other words, I know exactly where to put the cue. Go ahead, Gary. Then you can play just I a little bit of it. It's only a 10 high, clip high context, me. which means I am in a simple the environment. In other words, I know exactly where to. Were you able to see that, Tony? Yeah, I think people got a sense. That that's enough. It's, it, Carl's. It's, it's very similar to Carl's. Same thing. That's not my voice. We trained the voice. That's a picture. They put it into. I don't know what they used. To be honest with you, they showed me two or three. I said that one's the closest, but it's still creepy. So the I choices are big. Less gray in your hair is how did that happen? 
uh well that's because that picture was taken a while ago you know uh -huh. i have a, i have a good friend who used to work for research at bitly you know the the, the url shortening and she said you know on the internet, everybody is Superman. When in real life, they're Clark Kent. So, so you know, I want to be. I want to. I want to continue to be Superman. Let me just. Um, so that that that's kind of. Um, uh, you know, how do we how do we kind of create counterfeit humans? I think it's going to happen. There's no question. It's not going to happen. Regulations and all that are going to going to be lag far behind. And then I think we're going to have all kinds of remixes of Carl and I teaching class, and we're going to be dragged into all kinds of tribunals for stuff we never said in class. And it's going to be really fun to lock up the whole administration uh, with even more stuff uh, and more grievances. But at the same time, I want to push the envelope here because again, it's the one in five problem. Students want a lot more time from me than I can give. And I feel that um, I do feel using this technology and having played with it over the last year, it will benefit them greatly. Um, let me pause here, Anders. Do you want do you want to open things back up for conversation? Or would you like me to chat a little bit more about where things are going? It's up to you. Sure. Yeah, uh, I noticed that uh, David's presentation is up now. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Do you uh, want to pop back over, David? Yeah, and David. Do you want to just quickly? Yeah, I'll sure. Just, I'll, uh, I'll just put it, it right uh, here. Yeah. And then uh, we had a question. I wonder if you want to yeah. take the question before we go into David's, uh, because uh, Dr. Scott Zimmerman, uh, who always asks good questions, had a question for Tony and maybe all of you. And uh, and he says, so what does it mean to be a college professor 10 years from now? How much is automated? Is everything open sesame? Do we automate ourselves out of work and simply get royalties for the use of our images and thoughts? What do you think? Yeah, I'd like that's, to get the royalties. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> that's the optimistic view. I, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, look, we, 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 it's working in athletics, right? I mean, people's likenesses are getting, their people are making money for their likenesses as athletes. And, and so there is a precedent there. Um, uh, I, I think of it more as there's exploit and explore, right? So in, in fact, I had a conversation with my students about this yesterday, like, they're, they're saying education is so far behind. They're so far behind. They're not teaching us what we need to know. And I said, well, there's two kinds to education. There's research, the kind of stuff that David does, right? And Carl as well and me on one side where we're doing the research and trying to push the envelope. And then there's education, which is like trying to kind of do what Carl calls productive learning. You know, let's teach you the stuff that we figured out is the right stuff to do. Um, and, and so I think the teaching part of it probably most of it, if you think about, if you think about content that is static like physics you know it's still 9.8 meters per second it's still f equals ma and all that type of stuff i think that's totally you know digitizable you know i i think if you want to learn uh, philosophy maybe you maybe you slap on some some of um some of anders goggles even if you're in a submarine and you go chat in the stoa in ancient greece 2000 years ago and, and you could have more of an immersive learning experience so i think i think that the kind of the way that we can leverage this technology to have the right modality. David calls this the air gap, the right mix between technology and kind of contextual engineering. Um, I think we do a whole be a much better job in learning, but I, I, I don't think that the research side of things, which really drives everything in universities will go away. At least I hope it, it doesn't, or we'll all be in trouble because at the end of the day, you know, universities are there for a reason and that's the pursuit of truth. Right. And, and, and so, um, I'm still a fan on the university side of things, but I do think the education side of things is going to change quite dramatically. Okay. I'll uh, yeah. give a little bit on that too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, uh, you know, work in a research laboratory. I don't teach any classes except for one called i which is National Science Foundation, sort of like Shark Tank with evidence for uh, <laughs> taking your ideas from lab to launch. Uh, and uh, that's the only class I teach. But what I feel like we do is what students get in the classroom or from other sources and let them work shoulder to shoulder with world-class leaders, people like those on this call, to on actual projects. And then there's those of us that are affiliated with the university that are the sort of the guides, the Sherpas or the, uh, you know, the shepherds on some of this uh, type of work too, to uh, put together some of these bright young minds, give them the experience with world-class leaders and produce something of, of substance and of merit, whether that is uh, contributing to the body of knowledge, which is what research often is, or an actual work product, something that uh, that comes out that is a benefit to society, hopefully, is what we try and do. And uh, oftentimes that's a business idea. Sometimes that is, uh, you know, has to do with um, 
something that benefits health or safety or um, you know other areas. So that's been really fun to get a chance to uh, put those pieces together and give students those opportunities that you really can't get in a classroom, but you can apply what you got in the classroom together. I don't know that I think that's going away. I think it's going to change substantially and that on those teams, those uh, maybe super teams is a word we've been uh, using too, um, you start to have AI in the mix too, either, either as co-pilots or co-workers in that area, which sounds a little funny for some of you, I know. But uh, the example I, I talked about earlier with a 24x improvement in uh, the uh, team performance of having a uh, AI for writing Python code next to the actual developer, um, you know, the, the results speak for themselves. So we need to be teaching them how to do that. Yeah, do you want to do you want to highlight any of these slides? Because they were a little hard to see on your phone. Yeah, sure. Let's uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, just 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 start flipping through them, and I'll speak as uh, as we get to something. I'll have to ask you. To I think stop you can control them. Oh, you maybe you can't. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, just yeah. here you can uh, hit the next one. Okay, and, uh, I can. Yeah, no, no. So mm -hmm. UCF, large, uh, you know, public university, um, and I sit at the Institute for Simulation and Training. Next, oh. uh, David froze up. <laughs> uh oh, right now. Yeah. Well, you're you're here. How about now? Am I okay? Yeah. You're fine, David. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's go to the next one there. Uh, we sit at the epicenter yeah. of modeling and simulation for the world. Yeah, some UCF alums. Good, good. Um, this is about $7 billion for every branch of service. Um, I don't know if you've gone to the next slide. Mine is a little slow, but uh, yeah. And uh, having this research park where every single branch of service has all of their um, simulation modeling is, uh, is is key. Let's keep going until we hit, um, I'm, I'm gonna skip over a few of the slides um, here too, and just let us go directly to a slide that says uh, enterprise AI as a service, and we can stop there. But you can flip through and give a couple seconds on each of those too. I don't wanna take up too much time, but these are some of the examples that I uh, talked about too, in terms of work we've done with uh, Boeing for, uh, um, holographic co-pilot digital twin work for Department of Energy and uh, for the uh, Veterans Administration to build out buildings sometimes uh, a year or two or three before they actually are uh, 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 live physically built that they can start the planning process in that. So those are some of the things we've, we've gotten to do. Each of these projects has an element of AI in it, whether it's the uh, logistics and planning support and uh, predictive analytics, or having the embodiment of the knowledge of how to be a pilot, the checklist, if you will. Those are some of the types of things that we've uh, had a chance to uh, to do. Yeah, here's um, a list you were rattling off. We have custom LLM configurations where you can customize your own. Uh, yeah, this is too much mm -hmm. to go through, but yeah, um, the categories are important. And uh, the fact that we have things like uh, Sora, which can give you a minute of video from just a text prompt, is already having uh, ripple effects through Hollywood, but also through things like industrial video that we might have uh, within uh, the settings we do for training videos. Think about having Hollywood production levels for some of the work that's being done um, in training videos. That was not possible up until very recently. Uh, by recently, I mean like three weeks ago, maybe four weeks ago. So these are things that are changing very, very rapidly to be able to do a scene description just like you would do in a um, script. And then all of a sudden you have that, uh, that ability. So those are some of the things that we're exploring with this AI as a service type of model letting uh, chief learning officers, chief information officers, uh, you know, some of the people on the technology side get to explore this and look at the ethics of this, looking at uh, copyright, making sure that everything is done properly from that standpoint. Um, so those are all things that uh, uh, maybe university should be doing. And we, we mm -hmm. like to uh, get a chance to, to work in those areas too. Look at the good the bad and the ugly and see where we can use this for the benefit of society. I think those are some of the types of things that we have a, a good opportunity why I always love getting together with uh, these three gentlemen and uh, doing things with this whole network of training magazine too. Maybe we can go to the last uh, two slides there Anders to just to, to wrap up that uh, idea of 
you know, how do we do this for the, the, the good of society? And maybe what is the future of, of, um, of uh, universities look like? The last sentence is there too. We try and look at that oh. lab to long model. And we've had Sorry. students. Uh, so which slide? That, the uh, second to last slide. Yeah. This one? Or? Yeah. Um, okay. And uh, I had a chance to really have students launch companies and uh, major pro projects and research initiatives from inside of the university setting and uh, train the next generation of leaders and technologists. That's what I think a lot of this is going to be about, whether we have AI in the mix or not. So where that intersection of AI and spatial computing, the intersection of some of the back end technology like blockchain and other areas, those are all things that uh, we have to be critically concerned about for the future of um, cybersecurity, the future of these deep fakes that are much, become much easier with those audio tools and video tools and other things too. And then the very last slide too, just um, how, about how we think about these things and uh, connection for any of those that want to uh, continue on some of this discussion. We'd love to do that here at UCF at the Institute for Simulation Training. So, so uh, yeah, thank you, uh, David. Uh, always so inspiring to see all the work you, you're doing there. Uh, so a question that came up in preparation here uh, that uh, you guys raised that I, I think is, uh, is a fascinating one is from a learning, uh, an enterprise learning professional point of view, are we now uh, teaching uh, AI models rather than people? <laughs> you talk a lot there about how you're creating your own AI versions of yourself uh, and, and the challenges involved in that. Uh, uh, is our whole profession switching in this direction? Well, one of the things that, that I think is interesting, you know, I went the other day to a, a company and they were demonstrating how they could pretend to be a customer and interact with the customer salesperson who's who's learning how to interact. And it struck me that there's a middleman there. If uh, we don't need the customer service salesperson, if we can imitate a customer, we can imitate customer sales rep. So the thing that I think is becoming interesting, especially in learning and development, is the the you know people are, are worried about the existential threat of content creation. But AI isn't just happening to L and D; it's happening to everybody. So the customer service reps are no longer going to be available to be trained because they don't need them. The insurance claims adjuster are no longer going to need to be trained because we don't need them. Um, so I think it's very interesting where training is going. And I think, you know, uh, someone mentioned, Scott, I think mentioned about the, the divisiveness of the country and the, and the division. I think the training is going to go very high toward leadership, toward teaching. I, I'm a big advocate for teaching wisdom uh, because we need people to be wiser than they are, not just smarter, but wiser. Uh, and I'm a big advocate for thinking about the, the human skills that um, maybe not, maybe not, you know, by pure definition, make us human, but make us interact. And I think some of that, you know, we talk about society is, is what is the purpose of a company or organization if it can make these automatically crank out money and crank out opportunities with like four people. So then we've got to think about, well, are they there to help people communicate and survive and thrive and get together? So there's a lot of really, I think, interesting implications to that, that um, can't let us be teaching AI with, with AI. Um, we're not there yet. There's also, on the other hand, AI is way overhyped. Um, a lot of organizations are going, yeah, I got AI, and it's not really doing that much. Uh, it's doing some stuff, but it's not doing, you know, the, the promise. We're definitely in the, uh, I think, um, uh, peak of inflated expectations in terms of where we are, and we're headed toward the, the, the trough of disillusionment a little bit, but we'll come out of it. But I think that those are some issues, speaking of a can of worms, that, you know, that, that everyone is, is struggling with and thinking about how to deal with that moving forward. Tony, I think you were the one who raised this point. Yeah, um, I, I think that learning itself is going to change. And David and I, when we were getting together for this thing, kind of kind of got off on a, on, a, on a bit of a riff here where I think, you know, what is a learning environment? You know, we tend to think about the learning environment like the classroom's a learning environment or a simulation like Carl's Tom has a learning environment. And we could put non-playing characters in there and do that kind of stuff. Um, 
I think as we move into what I call the human machine interface, the human machine interface, the human and machine interface, human intuition, machine intelligence, um, I think that we're going to have immersive virtual environments. Back to the stuff Carl and I were writing in the in the the, for the book we did a while back, is that there's a virtual immersive environments where the environment itself learns and maintains state. In other words, the environment itself is a learning environment. And as you show up in it, uh, you contribute to it, you're part of it, uh, but 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 the, the, the space itself maintains state. And I think that that's really important because there's big parallels. I, I saw Car some of Carl's stuff. What's happening with, uh, with AI is if you look at like Microsoft, Microsoft's doing the co-pilot and that's all about being more efficient, you know, sometimes overcoming the deficiencies of their own product, right? Uh, I remember Gloria Gary always talking that 80% of training is comp compensatory for shitty pro uh, uh, software design, you know? So it's like, oh great, we'll put an AI co-pilot on top of this crappy software interface to make it all work kind of thing. And that's to make you more productive. To me, productive learning is, is focused on driving individual human conformity around best practice and known predictable situations to achieve efficiency. And, and obviously there's lots that can be done there. But the problem is we could fall into the routinization trap, which is going to automate the classroom bad assumptions and all. When what we really need now is we're moving past what I call the permaflex threshold, where there's going to be so much change coming. We need generative learning, like co-creative learning, focused on driving collective human creativity around the next principles for unknown, unpredictable situations to achieve sustainability. Generative learning is very, very different than productive learning. Ironically, all of this whole stuff, like all these GPTs or whatnot, or, or they're called generative AI. So I think what we have to do is, is marry productive and generative AI that's both machine and human and go up to the top right quadrant where we take the best of both and co-elevate so that we can figure out what the hell is going on in the world gone mad. Fascinating thought, uh, generative learning. Uh, so uh, David, on on that note, uh, you've been playing around with, uh, by the way, we, I know we're at the top of the hour here. We just did a quick decision here to go on for another 10 minutes. Feel free to drop <laughs> off, obviously, but uh, we'd love to just wrap up conversations here. Um, so how does this, what are they, they're kind of two big converging trends now with the spatial computing and the AI. And yeah, you've been playing around with the Ray-Ban as an example of how to, to bring AI out in the real world. <laughs> Tell us about it. So these glasses have Meta built in, the specifically the Llama 2 engine. So there's two cameras right here that hopefully you guys can see. And uh, with these glasses on, I can say, hey, Meta, what am I looking at? And uh, this is a new early access feature. And it tells me what in, in my ears, and you won't be able to hear it, what, uh, what I'm looking at. So if I'm looking at the, the cover of a book or you know something else like that too, then it will tell me the words on it, it'll tell me what it's about and, uh, and uh, start to do, like Tony and I were saying, the air gap between the real world around you and the digital world. So you could look at a scene, uh, and you're creating a digital twin, and it sees the scene, and then you tell it, I'd like for you to go ahead and make 3D objects and models of everything inside of this scene. Doesn't do that part just yet, but we have other tools that do. All we have to do is link the um, text description that comes in of the scene that you're looking at and then have it go in and uh, use another tool like WordEye or um, uh, Unity Muse or some of these other tools that allow you to just describe a scene. When you describe a scene, it goes and it builds it in 3D objects. That's this air gap between the real world and the digital world that uh, we're starting to see the pieces. Right now, you have to be in a research lab to kind of put stitch those pieces together, but I guarantee you it's probably just months before that is automated. Um, there's even some signs. Uh, next month is uh, the Worldwide Developers Conference from Apple, and uh, they are uh, doubling down on AI. It'll be interesting to see what they talk about and come out with, with the thought around the phone that you already have, which has so much multimodal communication being able to bridge the gap between the sensors that are in there, including your camera, including your audio microphones, and uh, other things like um, the, the motion tracking and stuff too, and be able to put that into a uh, multimodal input that creates your digital twin or your 3D scene output. Those are some of the different uh, things that we're watching very closely to see how 
that works for um, the general population and specifically for us as developers too. I think that there's a lot that uh, could be, uh, that could happen. Um, <clears throat> So I've been pretty excited about this too. We've been playing with, of course, the uh, Apple Vision Pro and some of the other tools in the space, but you're starting to see this uh, uh, real world meets digital world, which is kind of that last gap. If you have access to all the knowledge on the internet through an AI uh, large language model or a, a, a RAG or other types of, uh, of, of AI that's more advanced. And um, one other thing that's starting to happen, we're starting to see AI as the manager of other AIs. So all those ones that you have on the list, if you had one, we gotta say one ring to rule them all. You know, if you had one of these AI uh, project managers, it's still an artificial intelligence uh, module that can go and build out the um, capacity and capability of all those and put them all together in a final product. Um, things like auto GPT are starting to do that. Those are things that, um, you know, I didn't think would be possible, you know, six months ago, and uh, we're starting to see them there, too. Um, so, yeah, we don't want this to fall into the Google Glass area, too, and there is an opportunity for that, too, Bill. <laughs> Great question. Uh, this this uh, feels a little different than that, too, um, but, uh, you know, there are privacy issues and things like that, too. Those are some of the different um, areas that, uh, that I've been, um, you know, eager to explore and think about rather than just do. So I'll turn it over to you guys. And Dave, have, well, I, I've got a question. So have you been also look, following the, the, the use of sonar to track movements and uh, making that a little bit more efficient than let's say uh, visually tracking movements? Yeah, yeah, some of the uh, different uh, you know, tracking systems, Omnitrax and others too, Omnitrax that are, that are doing this are, um, you know, well in use. We've also got the uh, the haptic gloves from Haptex too that start to add other sensory input too. And uh, having a whole suite of that multimodal communication as input and output is something that, uh, you know, we're getting to experiment and explore on a regular basis. It's a good, good point, Carl. David Moore, Moore has been asking a couple of times. Artemis two will be launching soon, and if yes. if if if, <laughs> if, uh, if Anders gets to put you know goggles and submarines, are, are, are those kids going to have any fun stuff to play with up there in space? <laughs> yeah. So uh, sorry, I didn't see your question at first, but I see it now. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we're really excited about Artemis. We're really excited about some of the stuff that uh, SpaceX has uh, going too, and. Um, a friend is working on digital, uh, the orbital reef that is happening uh, for Blue Origin. There are all sorts of opportunities to put some of this technology into the space area. Star Command is coming to uh, Florida. That's been announced too. That is uh, some of the simulation and training uh, research that's uh, going on within Space Force too. So uh, yeah, we're gonna have a lot of this there too. There's already a lot of training that goes on uh, within NASA and within Space Force using these very uh, techniques. Uh, Anders, there was a, a slide in there too that showed one of those too. It might've gone very briefly uh, too, but uh, it showed some of the work we've done for Space Force there. I'd love to follow up with anybody who wants to. You've got my contact information. Um, I know we're getting close on time. There, there was another question about, you know, what does this mean for instructional design? Uh, you know, what are we going to do about that? And, and to pick up on a little bit of what Carl said, I think um, I think this this creates a whole new opportunity, right? So in, in the old world, we used to think about productive learning uh, and, and individual competence building by teaching content, right? So it was all about the content. And that was the big question is if content is kind of basically commodity, what is it? I, I think what, what the next kind of generation kind of learning magicians are going to be is context curators. Uh, and that's about creating shared environments where we have collective sense making, not just between humans, but between humans and intelligent machines. Um, so it's not, it, it, it's, 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 it's changing in two ways. You're not just kind of figuring out the ADI model and how do you distribute content? Because I, I put a, I put a couple of explainer AIs in there that, that can do that automatically already for 20 bucks a month. So I think we have to move up the stack just like everybody moves up the stack like David does in his lab. And we have to think about our jobs moving from, uh, you know, teaching content to curating context for learning to happen for both machines and humans. Um, now, obviously, that's a very different model, but the technologies are there and what David's doing in his lab to kind of he has to clue them together right now. But trust me, in an AI world, 
uh, kludging goes very, very quickly and then can be kind of instantiated into software that we download for five bucks a month. So, so kind of watch this space. Yeah, I, I think of it as, as a, a nearer term opportunity is basically creating uh, virtual coaches like what Tony's doing for um, our clients. Mm -hmm. So we've got somebody that says, hey, I need to be more efficient at selling. Okay, well, let's do a quick analysis of some of your uh, information and ideas. Let's look into your systems. How often are you in the CRM? How often do you do that, et cetera? Now let's take some uh, coaching uh, content. Let's put it into this app. Let's load the app to the phone. And all of a sudden, you've got personalized coach that is with you all the time. You as the instructional designer conceptualized it, helped them think through it and put it together. And when Terry, I think, asked, you know, are we essentially half robot? Um, I would argue we are already, right? If you carry your phone around, 90% uh, of people, the first uh, minute of when, after they wake up, pick up their phone. And so if you've got your phone and you use it as um, directions, as a, a photographer, editing photographs, to speak into it, all that kind of stuff, uh, we're already kind of leaning on robotics very heavily. So it's going to be interesting to see how that um, morphs more and more into what we're doing. Right now, it's content creation. Like, like So this is very interesting. Right now, you need a little bit of expertise to use AI. And what do I mean by that? Well, I have a friend who's a photographer. So when I type into a prompt to uh, Dali and say, hey, give me a, a picture of a dog sitting on the lawn, I get one image. He says, give me uh, this kind of lens with this exposure, this aperture, and this lighting. And his image looks a lot better than my images. But when I put together a paper or something, I know the structure that I want. I know what I want to say. I kind of know the examples. But I can say, OK, AI, now make that example one in marketing instead of learning and development or do it for accounting. So if you have a good knowledge and um, uh, a background, you can leverage AI more than uh, people that don't have that background. But to David's point, we're starting to get AI controllers that, okay, you want to know about uh, photographs. Okay, load this up, and now you can have better photographs. So I think those tools are coming and evolving. And the other thing that I think with, with Tony's example, you know, I was thinking as a student, of all those, the last one I want, like cup and contemplate, I want the real Tony. I don't want the AI Tony. But that's going to give him more time to do that. So uh, now, instead of wasting a lot of time with the same question over and over and over again, like what's going to be on the test? Well, if you read the syllabus, you would know what's going to be on the test, look to the objectives, but that's another point. Um, but now we can sit and talk about your future or talk about what's happening or those kind of things. So if we are smart about it, and my only hesitant there is ever since like the printing press, everybody said, hey, you're going to have more time. We're going to have four four day work weeks, technology is going to make life better and more efficient. You'll have more time for leisure. Well, that hasn't been accomplished yet, but I think that is a goal that we could all work toward. And some of these tools will, we are smart about them as individuals, allow that to happen. There was a little bit in the chat about OMG, you know, are we losing ourselves into the technology? Like we created technology and are we now kind of just the slaves to the te technology? I, I wrote a paper and I put my website up at the, there's kind of four scenarios I see in the future. The first is extinguished. I don't want to talk too much about that, but you know, AI run amok, whatever, uh, setting off nukes or something. Uh, the current one I kind of feel is enslaved. I feel like you know the technology is using us. If we want to do that, it's like we created, but we're somehow or other slaves to it. You know, picking up our phone six hundred times a day. You know, acting like Pavlov's dogs when the, when when Do Not Disturb comes on. The next is enmeshed. So one of the things I was going to talk about is, you know, the, the, the first Neuralink patient is now there, par paralyzed in a diving accident and is now, you know, not driving a car yet, but certainly navigating his, his, his uh, screen and so on and so forth. And the one I think we're really missing is empowered. Um, how do we kind of create these learning environments to allow people to become their very best selves and allow all the other affordances of technology and air gaps and everything else to, um, to allow people to become uh, their the, to, to realize their dreams. So so rather than you know conforming us to the technology, um, perhaps the technology should conform itself to allow us to become our best and brightest selves. And I feel if we if we flip the equation, if you think about right now, I think that um, 
technology, particularly in social media, is about you know, commanding your attention to control your consumption. We're essentially enslaved in this environment that sniffs our digital exhaust and then puts up a swipe left, swipe right, or buy this or don't buy that. Um, why not have the major algorithm not of being about commanding your attention, control your consumption, but about understanding your aspiration and finding your path? And I, it's just an algorithm. I think I, in, sometimes I think we're, we're not too far off from just if we could get the if we could get the technological algorithm right, we might be able to uh, to drive engagement at work more, uh, to to allow people to flourish, companies to flourish, society to flourish, economy to flourish, and 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 I, I mean that quite sincere, quite sincerely. I mean I think this technology has that power, and if we just use this technology to automate the past bad assumptions and all, we will be enslaved. What a great way to wrap up this session. And I think that's the, the hopeful vision is that we will all get superpower, we'll all be smarter, and we'll, it's gonna follow us around and be able to uh, visualize, uh, help uh, and um, have, have a tutor that's, that, that works with us uh, every step of the way. And uh, research has shown that the only educational intervention that really works is a personal tutor. Uh, but of course, we've never been able to scale that. And now we have uh, the digital versions of, uh, of you guys and uh, of all the world's knowledge that will, will benefit us all. So um, that's, uh, I think it's overall a really exciting uh, future, but obviously it's gonna be a lot of job displacement, uh, surely in the learning industry as well that we need to uh, discuss as well. So uh, with that, I, I wanna thank you so much. This is so insightful and the chat is just full of uh, great links and comments and conversations as well. Uh, so, and look for, uh, for the PowerPoint slides as well. So uh, thank you so much, gentlemen. And uh, Gary, back to you. All right. Well, I see some, uh, a lot of people actually requesting, could we get these guys on another session? Mm -hmm. I, I'm pretty sure because they like doing this together. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what makes it fun for me when we're in the prep sessions and, uh, and I get to hear them riff off of each other and, uh, and, and work together and exchange ideas. So we'll, we'll try to do that for you. In the meantime, I put up a link to the previous session when they did this last year, and I'll put it up again. So if you didn't check that out, uh, that should satisfy a little bit of your thirst. And uh, of course, we've taken giant steps before that. But I want to thank all of our, our guests today, David Metcalf, Tony O'Driscoll, Carl Kopp, and Anders Grunstad. Anders, thank you so much for pulling this together for us. Anders is doing a quarterly series that I asked him to do about a year and a half ago, and he's just doing a wonderful job of it. If you go to our recordings uh, you, and you uh, uh, just search for Anders, you will find uh, all of Anders' sessions, as, as uh, the quarterlies, as well as some other bonus sessions as well. I want to thank all of you for coming today, uh, all of you who make this uh, community cook. And uh, it was such great participation today. And I want to make sure that we thank Open Sesame, Open Sesame for sponsoring today's session, making it possible for this and many other sessions to be available to all of you for free. Drop by opensesame.com and see they can, how they can help you uh, discover and curate and inspire and create and everything that goes along with that. They're a wonderful company with 30,000 lessons that you might be able to use. Thank you very much for filling out the, uh, the uh, best or most useful ideas. And I'm going to go back uh, because I know some of you want to see uh, the link to uh, create a certificate for yourself for having attended for th this. Anders, do you have anything else or any of you gentlemen, anything else that you'd like to say in closing? Gary, I'm happy to share my charts. I sent them to you. So if, if, if people want them, I don't know if, if there, see, people see me want charts, I'm happy to share what I provided. So you're welcome to share them with, I don't know if there's a vehicle to do that. I, I could go ahead and upload those in just a few moments. Of course, I haven't been looking at email while we're doing this, but I'll go find it. And for anybody who wants to remain for a few moments, I, I can uh, <clears throat> go ahead. I, I would just say in the British way, you know, AI is here, remain calm. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> at the same time, uh, you know, a wise doctor at our AI and ML forum that we hosted at a big uh, health IT conference said, AI is not going to replace your doctor, but... Doctors who use AI 
will replace your doctor. Mm -hmm. And I think the same thing is true in a number of professions. When we look at digital engineering, when we look at uh, instructional design, all the different aspects that make up what our professions are too. And maybe we can take that to heart too and think about how we are thoughtful about how we use it as, uh, as our tools for the future. Thank you, David. Carl, uh, anything to close with well, there? So my, uh, I, I think early on in the um, polling, we saw about 44% of people rarely used it or didn't use it as much. I'd say the number one thing that you should do is use it. Uh, pay the $20 a month um, for whatever AI uh, tool you want and just play with it. See how it works, experiment with it, see what it's good for and what it's not good for. Uh, knowing and being comfortable with interacting with it is going to give you a sense of, yeah, okay, this really isn't a threat. This is kind of a broad, you know, over here. But here, this is where it's a little bit better. So maybe I can leverage it over here. So I think um, the more you know, the better off you are. And I would also say um, load it on your phone uh, and use, uh, as Tony said, the students were interested in audio. I use audio-based um, chat GPT frequently for asking questions and, and getting feedback. And it's it's a pretty powerful tool for uh, certain things. So uh, play with it, experiment with it, get your hands dirty. That's the best way to really understand what it will and won't do for you. So Carl, you were demonstrating to us uh, uh, the other day how you could have a conversation with your phone and AI. Yeah, so. Uh, can, can you show us that now yeah, since sure. we're in overtime? I have, yeah. Yep. Now or in overtime? Uh, no, we are now. in overtime. So yeah, oh, knock okay. yourself out. Mm -hmm. So I have ChatGPT on my phone and on there's a little uh, headset. And if you click on the headset, it puts it into audio mode and then you can ask a question. So I can say, hey, uh, ChatGPT, can you tell me about how to create a branching scenario? Sure. Still a little delayed, I remember. <laughs> yeah. There, okay, All right, uh, yeah. Um, oh, uh, uh, tell me more, ChatGPT. Clearly identify what skills or knowledge you want your learners to develop. This will guide the content and structure of your scenario. Follow the scenario, develop a story or situation relevant to the learning objectives. So anyway, so she has a conversation with me. And then the really interesting thing is, at the end of the conversation, you can ask uh, AI to analyze the conversation. So I will frequently say, hey, based on what we discussed and the questions I asked, am I basic, intermediate, or advanced? And then she'll give me uh, information about why I'm basic and, and what kind of questions I ask. So not only can, can it help us with seeking knowledge or thinking through things, but it also does a little bit of a meta-analysis of our discussions. And if we're smart about that, we can learn from that as well. So it's a really interesting uh, tool. And again, that's just, that's ChatGPT4. Um, so uh, that's something that people could play with and experiment with as well. Thank you, Carl. I appreciate it. And uh, Tony, you see the note that I put up there for you uh, uh, on the right side of your screen. Oh, I will. Yeah, I'll resend them. And I, okay. I would echo, I think, uh, David exemplifies this all the time, right? I, I always joke, I remember, I don't know, 15 years ago being with David at some training conference mm -hmm. somewhere, and he was writing a book about mobile on mobile. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think David is is the exemplar of just do it. This yep. is not something to think about. You know, sometimes you have to think your way into a new way of acting. Uh, I think with AI, you've got to act your way into a new way of thinking. You just, you got to jump in and give it a go. Ethan Mollick says you need 10 hours. After 10 hours, yeah, it'll click. So, so find 10 hours in the next week pick it doesn't really matter which one you pick but you as carl says uh you you'll you'll find where the leverage is for whatever you do pretty quickly uh so i would say be like nike just do it yep glad to see you back Rich. david uh tony's been right. trash talking you and uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> carl do you have anything uh or, i mean uh, uh anders do you have uh, anything you want to wrap up with yeah no that, that's exactly right uh get the GPT-4 uh, for, for 20 bucks, get the uh, Quest headset for uh, just 500 bucks, start experiencing it, live in the future. That's the only way to uh, be able to uh, creatively uh, be able to think about how to, how to use this tool. So great. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate it.
you gentlemen Mr. have Mr. all Sunday, been yeah. so generous yeah. with your I, time. I feel like we could go around again yeah. and everybody and we get more insights, but we can't abuse you that much. So all right. uh, instead, we'll just all thank right. you and, and yeah. say thank you again, Anders, and, and all Thanks. of you. And we'll see you next Good time. Good seeing you guys. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> And once again, for